I'm Chris Giancarlo, the former chairman of the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the regulator of the world's largest commodity and derivative markets. These days, I'm senior counsel at the American law firm Wilkie, Farr & Gallagher, based in New York City. And I'm also a principal in the Digital Dollar Project. At the start of this year, I launched the Digital Dollar Project at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. The Digital Dollar Project is, is a think tank devoted to the public discussion of the merits of a tokenized form of the US central bank digital currency, a CBDC, or what we termed a digital dollar. The project is a partnership between Accenture, the global consultancy firm, and the Digital Dollar Foundation, which I formed as a not-for-profit foundation with my brother Charles, a prominent Silicon Valley entrepreneur, and the CFTC's former chief innovation officer, Daniel Gorfine. The project is not a commercial venture. We have no business model to promote. Our mission is entirely one of serving the public interest. The foundation is self-funded. It turned to Accenture because of Accenture's involvement in almost every CBDC project around the globe. And Accenture agreed to provide its services to the project on a strictly pro bono basis. The project's mission is to encourage research and public discussion on the advantages and challenges of a digital dollar, to convene private sector thought leaders and actors, and to propose possible models to support the public sector in exploring a US CBDC. The project looks to help formulate a framework for potential practical steps that can be taken to establish a dollar CBDC. And we advocate for the launch of a series of real world pilot programs to explore the issues and complexities of a US CBDC. The Digital Dollar Project has assembled an extraordinarily experienced advisory board in order to bring together many perspectives and professional disciplines. The board includes economists, business leaders, technologists, innovators, lawyers and academics, consumer advocates, and human rights experts. And it is fully nonpartisan. The project looks to help formulate a framework for potential practical steps that can be taken to establish a US CBDC. And the project actively engages with the US Congress, senior administration officials, and policy bodies in the US and abroad. Now, when we refer to a US dollar CBDC, we use the phrase digital dollar. We chose that title because it's catchy. However, it's not entirely accurate. The dollar is already digital in the form of electronic bank accounts. But what we are talking about is tokenized fiat money, not accounts-based money. What is the difference? Well, allow me to take you on a brief short history of money. Money has evolved over the span of human civilization. Initially, trade was through barter. A chicken traded for a clay pot. However, what does a society do when a person wants to trade a blanket but doesn't necessarily need a clay pot in return? Well, the answer was a token that society recognized as representing value and could be traded for any good, whether it was a clay pot, a chicken, or a blanket. The first token may have been shells or beads. Well, they evolved into things that carried some inherent value, such as salt, which was the currency of the Roman army from which the English word salary derives, or coins minted from precious metals like silver and gold. In more recent times, tokens of currency were based on intangible items of little intrinsic value, such as paper, or today, polymer. As economies evolve into the future, so will their tokens, and they will become digital. The physical paper dollars in circulation today are tokens. They are tokens that are legal tender, meaning that the US commercial, that US commercial entities are required to accept them as a form of payment. They enjoy the full faith and credit of the United States government, meaning that the US government guarantees their acceptance 
by U.S. banking institutions and conversion into accounts-based money. In comparison, the accounts-based dollars that can be spent by use of credit and debit cards and money drawn with a check are accounts-based money. Most money used in the global economy is account-based. They are obligations of the financial institutions that support them. A major technological distinction between token-based and account-based money is the process of verification. With token-based money, verification is primarily performed by the recipient, confirming that the token is authentic and not counterfeit. On the other hand, accounts-based money requires third-party authentication of the identity of both parties to the transaction and ascertainment of the adequacy of funds in the transferor's account. I often explain the difference by pointing out that when one uses Zelle or Venmo, you are still using accounts-based money. The transaction is a series of messages instructing movement by third parties of accounts-based money. When you swipe your phone against a reader for an Apple Pay transaction, for example, it is another series of messages. You are not actually transferring value. Some commercial enterprise somewhere is doing that upon receipt of those messages. And here's the issue. They're collecting a fee to do so. With a digital dollar, we're talking about swiping your mobile device and actually moving real money from you to someone else immediately, just like cash but without any messages or intermediaries, and quite plausibly, without any fees. And quite immediately, without any loss of time. Today, you can share a photo or a video with someone around the world in a second, but it takes days, if not weeks, to send a few hundred dollars, and at a cost of 7 to 17%. A major drawback to accounts-based money is that moving it is costly, relatively time-consuming, and somewhat exclusionary. That is, because not everyone has easy access to bank credit. The major drawback to fiat money is that it works best in local physical environments. It's hard to transport and cannot be utilized in online commerce. Well, a digital dollar addresses the weaknesses of the two existing forms of money. A digital dollar would make sending money as simple as immediate and as cost-free as sending a text message. At the end of May 2020, the Digital Dollar Project released its initial white paper, and you can access it at digitaldollarproject.org. The white paper outlined a successful model for a tokenized digital dollar that has the same legal status as physical currency. Our white paper, provides details on how we view the structure, operation, and benefits of a digital dollar. And let me review a few of the key tenets of our proposal. It would be a third format of money in addition to fiat and accounts-based money. It would, be a to it would be tokenized, not accounts-based, as I explained. It would enjoy the full faith and credit of the US government, just like fiat currency, which Bitcoin and stable coins do not enjoy and we would maintain the two-tier banking system. The Digital Dollar Project proposes that the issuance, distribution, and redemption of a US CBDC should, should take place just as cash does today, issued by the Federal Reserve to domestic banks or regulated entities against reserves. Banks would distribute digital dollars to domestic end users' digital wallets against bank deposits and against collateral to non-resident banks. For consumers, digital wallets would offer essential payment functionalities integrated with existing banking services. Payments at point of sale would still be conducted through conventional terminals or fully contactless solutions. Only with digital dollars, the terminals would not be generating messages, but transferring actual value peer to peer. Regulated entities would extend such wallets to their customers through existing outlets from mobile phone applications. And for unbanked end users, wallet services could come preloaded on mobile phones. Our digital dollar proposal is not antithetical to other virtual currency efforts, whether commercial like Libra or decentralized like Bitcoin. 
Our proposal is also monetary policy neutral. We take no view on issues of money supply. A digital dollar is a policy tool, not a policy expression. Our proposal is also sensitive to rights of financial privacy. We must get the balance right between individual privacy and law enforcement. This is especially so in light of the US Constitution's restrictions on government infringement of rights of privacy. Our proposal posits that the many technological decisions and design choices should be driven by functional needs. Technological form should follow public policy function. And we also advocate that exploration of a digital dollar should be conducted in partnership between the private sector and the public sector. Earlier this year, I had the honor to represent the Digital Dollar Project in testimony before three U.S. congressional committees. I made the case for the U.S. Treasury. I made the case for the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve to test and explore a U.S. CBDC, working with the private sector in a series of pilot projects. We believe this is the right approach to exploring key areas of concern, such as individual privacy, cyber resilience financial inclusion, and interoperability, to mention just a few. These pilots can be conducted nationally and discreetly through local routes. For example, a pilot program could test the treasury management and security benefits for small businesses over physical cash handling, as well as the cost benefits from minimizing card processing fees and longer settlement times. Overall, a pilot program could work with retailers and card networks to explore whether a US CBDC could potentially be more cost-effective, efficient, convenient, secure, or inclusive than accounts-based alternatives. And I invite you to examine our proposed pilot programs on our website, digitaldollarproject.org. The Digital Dollar Project believes that the ultimate reason why the United States should explore a US CBDC is to modernize the dollar itself, not because others are doing it, but because modernization of economic infrastructure is a good all by itself. We should modernize the US dollar for the same reason we must modernize all economic and commercial infrastructure to keep pace and benefit from advanced new architectures of technology and innovation. We should modernize the dollar to make sure that the values that are enshrined in the US dollar today, values like freedom of speech, individual privacy and economic privacy, free enterprise and free capital markets are enshrined in the digital future of money. We are entering a new digital age what some people call the internet of value. Now the first internet era is considered the internet of information. Wikipedia is an example of that first wave, a massive decentralized online reference authority composed collaboratively by volunteers who share knowledge and write peer reviewed entries without pay. That first internet wave is being superseded by the next wave, the internet of things, in which everything from assembly lines to refrigerators will be connected to the internet. And that wave will soon be followed by the next wave, the internet of value. And in this wave, things of value like energy and agricultural and mineral commodities, contracts and stock certificates and land records and property titles, and cultural assets like music and personal assets like votes in an, in an election, even personal identities will, able, will be able to be stored, managed, transacted, and moved around in a secure private way from person to person without third party intermediaries. This next wave of the internet of value also has the potential to shift the medium of trust from large centrally managed institutions with legal authority to person to person digital handshakes powered by cryptography, tokenization, shared ledgers, and a network of personal computers and smartphones. And nowhere will the internet of value have a more dramatic impact than the area of money. The birth of Bitcoin in the wake of the 2009 financial crisis was the first iteration of the internet of value in the form of a digital asset. 
Since then, the private sector has launched thousands of budding non-sovereign cryptocurrencies of lesser or greater promise. And they include instruments like Bitcoin that are decentralized and not tied to any national currency. Instruments called stable coins that are also decentralized but offer some degree of price stability by connection to sovereign currencies. And private stable coins built on private blockchains for use by selected users like those developed for customers of JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. The Digital Dollar Project believes that if we act now, we can harness this wave of innovation, the internet of value, to increase financial inclusion, drive societal and economic benefits, and enshrine democratic values in the future of money for generations to come. We believe the time has come to explore a digital dollar. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Well, I think we're seeing it with the COVID pandemic. Um, I think uh, it's having the effect of speeding up uh, technological uh, innovation uh, in, in many, many fields, uh, from, from pharmaceuticals and immunization, but also we're certainly seeing it, I think, spinning up a movement away from uh, physical fiat currency to central bank digital currency. Certainly, it's had a tremendous impact here in the United States in uh, the official sector and the private sector looking at uh, central bank digital currency uh, as a way of solving some of the problems that have been prevalent uh, during the pandemic. So I think that is certainly one thing that is speeding things up in terms of innovation and adoption. Well, in our digital dollar project does not call uh, that for CBDC to exist exclusively uh, without uh, uh, other uh, uh, crypto assets and, and cryptocurrencies. We think it should exist side by side with them. In fact, the innovations that are taking place in, in other uh, non-CBDC non crypto assets are actually spurring on innovation in, in the official sector. So uh, I think that uh, uh, certainly in, in the medium term, I don't see an impact on them. I think their growth and uh, innovation will continue. And I think that is, that's for the good of society. So we're very supportive of, of that development. 